A reading from the Word of God, written in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 14a, and verse 22 through to verse 32. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, 
a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, and you yourselves know this man. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to hates, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor, David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. For seeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of all of us are witnesses. The word of the Lord. Psalm 16, found on page 484. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land. But those who run after other gods, their libations of blood I will not offer. O oh Lord, you are my portion and my cup. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. I have set the Lord always before me. My heart therefore is glad and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave. Nor let your holy one see the pit. I will show, you will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and shall be forever. reading from the Word of God, written in the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, reading from verse 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his grace, by his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 
and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that through perishable, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord.
I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will sing the symphony of the Lord has been. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. Rejoice for he has made me glad. Name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Welcome to a service on the second Sunday of Easter. May the Lord be with you. If there is anything that proves the victorious kingship of Jesus Christ, it is his resurrection from the dead. And it's so thrilling to be able to share in this fact with other believers. The gospel writers record various stages in the experience of the believers with reference to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I've identified three main points from the text of the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. First of all, they thought that Jesus was dead. We are encouraged to use our vivid imagination to capture that moment when the women came to roll away the stone, only to find that Jesus' body was no longer there. The women came to the tomb carrying their spices with the intention of anointing Jesus' body. And they actually thought that he was dead. In fact, they wondered how they would move that tremendous stone that blocked the entrance of the tomb. And it's quite remarkable that they didn't really believe in his resurrection when he had told them so many times, so repeatedly. We must never underestimate the importance and the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The world believes that Jesus died, but the world does not believe that he rose from the dead. At Pentecost, Peter's message emphasized the resurrection. In fact, it is more emphatically stated in the book of Acts. So what then 
may we ask, is the resurrection. What is the significance of the resurrection? Well, I've identified six reasons. And I'll just remind us what it says in the uh, gospel reading in John chapter 20. When it was evening of the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, and the, the doors of the house where the disciples had met was locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, peace be with you. So my first reason is it proves that Jesus is God's son. Jesus stated that he had authority to lay down his life and to take it up again. John chapter 10, verse 17 to 18. Secondly, it verifies the truth of scripture in both the Old and New Testament. His resurrection is clearly taught in Psalm 16, uh, verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in shoal, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Psalm 110, verse 1 also states, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Third reason is that it assures our own future resurrection. Because Jesus died and rose again, one day we shall raise to be like him. Fourth, more significantly, the entire structure of the Christian faith rests upon the foundation of the resurrection. If we didn't have the resurrection, then we would have no hope or future. It is the basics for Christ's heavenly priesthood. Because he lives eternally, he's able to save us to the utmost. He lives to intercede for us. And that glorious song, which I like so much, Because he lives, I can... Tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future, and life is living just because he lives so he lives because he lives eternally he's able to save us for the utmost fifth it gives power for christian living we are unable to do things in our own strength it is only as his resurrection power works in and through us that we can do his will and bring, bring glory to his name and the sixth reason is that he assures us of our future inheritance. Because we have a living hope, we can experience hopeful living. Because Jesus Christ is alive, we have a glorious future. And so whenever we as Christians gather together on the Lord's Day, we bear witness to the fact that Jesus is alive and that the church has received spiritual blessings. So my second main point is that they heard that Jesus was alive. And uh, if we read Matthew chapter 28, verses 2 to 8, it says, And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. Two angels appeared, and one of them rolled away the stone from the door. Naturally, the soldiers on duty were greatly frightened by this sudden demonstration of this mighty supernatural power. The stone was not rolled away to permit Jesus to come out, for he had already left the tomb. They rolled the stone away so that people could see that the tomb was indeed empty. And so one of the angels spoke to the woman and tried to alleviate her fears. He's not here. Come and see. And bear in mind that these women and his disciples did not expect Jesus to be alive. What did they see in the tomb? The gravestones lying there on the stone shelf, still wrapped in the shape of the body. Jesus had passed through the grave's clothes, 
and left them behind as evidence that he was alive. And so you can say that they resembled like an empty cocoon, you know, like when the caterpillar left the cocoon and there was this um, shape that was left in the form of the body. There didn't appear to be any sign of struggle and the grave clothes was not crushed up. Even the napkin which wrapped his face was carefully folded. It is not difficult to understand the mixed emotions at that particular time, from fear to terror to joy that they may have, that may have gripped those women who had gone to the tomb to see Jesus' body. It must have been a remarkable, remarkable experience. We cannot begin to imagine the evidence in the same way that the believers did on that first Easter Sunday. But we have the evidence of the word of God. Jesus was not held by the bond of death. He had promised to rise from the dead and his promise has never been broken. And the reading reminds us that the, the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord and instantly he instilled the spirit of peace in their hearts. Peace be with you. The most remarkable change in the early Christians is another demonstration of his resurrection. One day they were discouraged and afraid and on the other hand, they were declaring his resurrection and walking in joy and victory. In fact, they were willing to die for the truth of the resurrection. And if all this was a manufactured tale, then it would never have changed their lives so significantly. The gospel reading, uh, readings and the scripture readings remind us that there were over 500 witnesses who saw Jesus alive or saw him at one time. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 3 to 8. And these experiences of the risen Christ could not be easily explained as delusions. The people who saw him were indeed surprised. It would have been impossible for over 500 people to suffer delusions or hallucinations, if you may call it at the same time, and even the Apostle Paul, who was an enemy of the church at one time, also saw the risen Christ. And that experience so incredibly transformed the lives of those who met with the risen Christ. The earliest reference to the resurrection is in Paul, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 4. And this is particularly significant because Paul is also the only person from whom we have a first-hand account of an encounter with the risen Christ. In 1 Corinthians, Paul reminds his re readers of the gospel that he received from the apostles after his conversion in the year uh, 33. And the message in this context is that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, and most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, Paul adds, as to one untimely born, he appeared to him, uh, Paul himself also. So Paul's own encounter with the risen Lord is fully described in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. And then in his speeches reported in Acts. In Acts chapter 22, verses 6 to 9, Paul says, As I made my journey and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone about me. And I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul! Saul, why do you persecute me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. In other words, in this account, it was an inner voice. 
On the other hand, in the passage in chapter 9, the others heard the voice, but they, they didn't see anything. And later on in Acts chapter 26, verses 13 to 16, Paul was talking to King Agrippa. And Paul re repeats his story, saying that on his way to Damascus, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul! Why do you persecute me? And so here again, his companions saw the light, but they did not hear the voice. Here the voice speaks for much longer than in the other account. Jesus going to commission Paul as his apostle to the Gentiles. And so we see that in this overwhelming experience of the Damascus Road experience, Paul saw a bright light. Receive a vision of Jesus and hear the voice. The existence of the church, the New Testament, and the Lord's Day add proof or further proof that Jesus is alive. For centuries, the Jews had been God's people and they'd honored the seventh day, the Sabbath. Then a change took place. Jews and Gentiles united in the church and became God's people. They met on the first day of the week, which was the Lord's Day. If Jesus is not dead, then the New Testament is a lie, for every part of it points to a risen Christ. And these, there are, of course, many Christians who have experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ in their own lives, whether in worship, in vision, in prayer, in reading the word of God, etc. However, it is possible for people to doubt and to become self-deluded. For example, we read about um, Doubtful Thomas, where he says, unless I see the mark of the nail in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. That's why he was probably nicknamed Doubtful Thomas. And I think perhaps Jesus wanted to strengthen Thomas's faith and wanted to include him in his blessings. And I think Thomas reminds us that unbelief can rob us of the blessings of God and opportunities that he presents to us. When I read about Thomas, it in one sense re represents the scientific approach whereby the scientist relies on the validity of the test or experiment that he has devised. And so we need to remind ourselves that as Christians we put our faith in God and in his word. But those who are unsaved put their faith in their own things. And as we read also the Gospel of John, chapter 20, we're reminded that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As we read the Gospel, we come face to face, face with Jesus Christ, how he lived, what he said, and what he did. And all this evidence point to the fact that Jesus is God come in the flesh, the great Savior of the world. As Christians, we have the weight of history, scripture, and dependable, dependable witnesses to back up our own personal experience of faith. And we must tell people about the resurrection. We cannot keep such good news to ourselves. The angel sent the women to tell of, of Christ's own disciples. They should have been expecting the news, but instead... They were doubtful and very questioning. And my third major point is that they met the living Christ personally. Jesus came and he stood among them. When we are obeying God's word, he comes to us. When we trust in him wholeheartedly, he comes to us. When we cry out to him in prayer, he comes to us. 
Jesus had already appeared to Mary Magdalene in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're reminded that Jesus' first two resurrection experiences were seen by believing women. They were faithful and they were obedient to Jesus and were the last to leave Calvary. But they were also the first to come to the tomb. They were indeed devoted to Jesus. They trusted and believed in him. So when they saw Jesus, they shouted, all hail, which can be translated as grace. And what a marvelous greeting for the resurrection day. The women worshiped Jesus, they fell at his feet, and he must have this de detected some fear because he turned to them and he said, do not be afraid. They had seen the greatest excitement we have ever, ever seen in history. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it glorious that they had this wonderful experience? And I wonder how you would react if you met with Jesus in this way. Would you worship him and sit at his feet? Would you rejoice and be glad to know that you've met with the awesome one? Would you tell people about him and talk about all that he has done for you? Would you receive this amazing gift of the peace that he had offered to his disciples? We're reminded that the news about Jesus' resurrection began to spread among his fellow f followers. At first, slowly, but later, with much enthusiasm. Even his own disciples did not believe, as I said, especially Thomas. And they required proof. But it's important to note that when people accepted the reality of his resurrection, that their lives were never the same again. They were transformed. That same transforming experience is also available to us today. And as we read through the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31, we are reminded of the immense changes that took place in the lives of the people. And this was so evident. Perhaps you two can ponder and ask yourself the questions, have I personally met with the risen Christ? Has he actually changed my life? And in what ways has he changed my life? The 10 disciples changed from fear to courage and doubt in Thomas changed from unbelief to confidence. And the gospel story is inviting us to put our trust in Jesus Christ and be changed from death to eternal life. Because it tells us um, that he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abided on him. There is something in our human nature that makes it easy for us to doubt and to believe lies. Lies. We find it harder to believe the truth. It was not until the coming of the spirit of Pentecost and the powerful witness of the apostles that the Jews in Jerusalem discovered the truth. Jesus was alive. Anyone who studies this evidence will conclude that the resurrection of Christ, Jesus Christ is an historic fact that cannot be refuted. Jesus appeared to the two Emmaus disciples that day and also to the ten disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem. And one week later, later he appeared to the eleven disciples and dealt with Thomas's unbelief. On the first Easter Sunday, Jesus also made a physical appearance to Peter. That day began with the disciples and the women thinking that Jesus was in fact dead. Then they were told that he was alive. And following that announcement, they met him personally. They had met with the risen Lord. And so 
the message of the gospel is that we have a new hope in Christ Jesus. In a very complicated world today, many people are lonely, many people are afraid, and there is a desperate cry for freedom, for security, for forgiveness, for comfort. Many of us are fearful and troubled about the devastating effects of COVID-19, which we are uh, confronted with at the moment. And quite rightly so, we are fearful. Many of us have lost loved ones or have been immensely tra traumatized by the reportings and the pictures of things that we've seen and things that we've listened to on the radio, reports that we've heard around and have read about over the past few weeks. And the uncertainty of all this is that we do not know when it will come to an end. But Jesus knows. He promises in his word that he'd never leave us or forsake us and that he'll be with us always until the very end. So the answer to our questions, friends, lie in Jesus, who died for our sins and who rose victoriously on the cross and offers his Holy Spirit to all who believe in him. The risen Christ in Luke chapter 14, verses 45 to 48, helps the two confused disciples on the road to Emmaus to stop groping with despair and confusion. It tells us then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, who should suffer and on the third day raised from the dead, and that repentance, forgiveness of sins, should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. So my question is, what things are we witnesses of? Well, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the offer of forgiveness to all who repent. The most remarkable thing about the gospel is that the gift of Jesus Christ who offers forgiveness of sins. You can never add which cannot be forgiven. Because when you come before Jesus Christ in a state of humbleness, he puts your sins in a box, a box that has a key that locks it, and he throws away the key. And he puts up a sign which says, no more to be seen. The covenant of love offered in Jesus Christ relates to experience. In 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel of Christ is not just in accordance with scripture, but the living Christ appeared to Cephas, the 12 to the 500 who believers, who other believers all at once, and James and to Paul. So why can't we be witnesses? Well, because we can become paralyzed by the poverty of our own spiritual experience. We can become, become paralyzed by our own fears and anxiety and unbelief. Perhaps we feel that we have no witness to bear. We can become very crippled by things, negative things that are happening around us and thus miss out on this incredible experience. So what should our response be to the resurrection of our risen Lord? In the words of the psalmist in uh, Psalm 96, verses 7 to 10, the psalmist says, Let us ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name in everything we do. Let us act in such a way that clearly recognizes the nature and power of the Jesus we adore. Let us approach him in the spirit of deepest awe. That is to say, tremble before him. Give him the glory and the praise and the honor that he so deserves. The psalmist goes on to say that all created things should praise God. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth exult. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the, ex the field exult and all that is in it. 
Then shall all the trees of the forest shout for joy before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. And this judgment, my friend, like on Calvary, delivers us, offers forgiveness, new life, new birth, new creation. As the Apostle Paul said, anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. So many of us, if we are true to ourselves, will say that we experience trials, temptation, hurts, pains, suffering, loss. But the Lord of the resurrection is here and the dawn of the new day is breaking upon us. He uses our experience of failure, of pain, of sorrow, of loss, and he mixes them with joy and peace to weave this magnificent tapestry the underside, which can be messy and not very nice, and the outside, the top side, which is always beautiful. It's a bit like the Good Friday story. Good Friday when things are very messy, very ugly, and ugh, and cruel. And on the contrast, there's Easter Day, which is glorious. Things are bright, joyful, and victorious. The two sides, though, are very necessary to compare with each other. And we are indeed the handiwork of God and the glorious uh, picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nelson Mandela, in one of his speeches, puts it beautifully when he said, our deepest fear isn't that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It's her light, not her darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your plain small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. Within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone, he says. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear and anxiety, our presence automatically liberates others. In closing, the gospel reading has alerted us to the reoccurring theme of our Christian faith. The very need to argue for the truth of the risen Lord and to expose and demolish unchristian beliefs of what happened. Those who believe in the resurrection need to be constantly vigilant about the severe attacks that can come upon us and condemnation from others who do not know him. We also need to be sure that we are allowing the resurrection to permeate our own lives, our thoughts and imaginations, our very being, in fact. There's no point in wanting to defend and explain God's new world if we want to remain comfortable in the old world that we're in. We have to be like a, a beautiful flower bursting forth, giving off this beautiful perfume, full of glory, full of new life in him. And may we continue to be like beacons of light, shining in the dark world that we're in. I want to finally conclude with a poem of a pastor, an apostle as he called himself, who became a martyr of Christ. Uh, he was uh, based and ministering in Zimbabwe. And he wrote this poem before he was executed and they found it on his dead bed. And this is someone who actually had an experience, he said, of meeting with the living Christ, Jesus. 
I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his, and I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My presence makes sense. My future is secure. I'm done. I'm finished with low living. Sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarf goals. I am no longer need, I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaundits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, or first, or tops, or recognized, or praised, or rewarded. I live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by his patience, live by prayer, and labor by his Holy Spirit power. My face is set up, my gate is fast, my goal is in heaven, my road may be narrow, my way rough, my companions few, but my guide is reliable and my mission is clear for all to see. I will not be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of the adversary. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up or let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up and preached up for the cost of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes in his glory. And when he comes, he comes for his own. He'll have no problem in recognizing me. My colors will be clear. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I must have Jesus in my whole life. I must have Jesus in my life. In my walking, in my talking, in my sleeping, in my waking. I must have Jesus in my life. Stand and return to page one zero. Intercession, page 120, form H. 
Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, yes, give us all the reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, yes, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that you may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that you may share with all your sins in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy,
rendering thanks to you for the wonderful redemption which you've made possible for us in him. And we beseech you, O Father, to accept upon your heavenly altar the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all your whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, all who shall be partakers of this Holy Communion may be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction, and be numbered in the glorious company of your saints. And here we offer and present unto you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, our bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and lively sacrifice. And although we are unworthy to offer unto you any sacrifice, yet we beseech you to accept this, a bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be unto you, O Father Almighty, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Please turn to page 144. We say the Lord's Prayer together. As our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Body. 